Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we will be looking at the provisions of Chapter 8 in the ASCE 716, Minimum Design Loads for Buildings and Other Structures. In particular, we will be looking at the basic provisions in that chapter and how to apply them to the, to the design of uh, roof rain load. So the first thing to keep in mind when looking at the uh, ASC 716 provisions for rain load is to uh, look at some definitions. And we need to be aware of both the primary and secondary uh, rain collection and rain uh, diversion systems uh, found or described in the, uh, in the provisions. Okay, so we have the primary rain system and the secondary rain system. Now, uh, not every structure has two separate types of rain collection and distribution and uh, disposal systems. Where you tend to, where you're required to have a se uh, secondary system, is cases where uh, water could otherwise puddle or pond or gather on a rooftop. So, in other, so let's look at a simple, uh, let's look at a simple case, a ordinary everyday house, just like a single family home, that scale of structure. If you have something like that. Um, if you have a single family home with a sloped roof, um, this would be a rather steep sloped roof. And we'll just draw a simple classic house. Here you're not going to have, or you're not going to need a secondary rain collection system. Uh, rain, when rain falls, uh, when rain falls on the roof of the building, it simply flows off the roof. Or if you're feeling, um, if you want to be a little better and you actually want to uh, protect your foundation a little more, you can add downspouts and gutters and all sorts of uh, rain collection and distribution piping uh, to uh, dispose of the rain either to a uh, either to the local either to the lawn or to maybe a storm drain as to a storm drain if your uh, local code allows that. Uh, depending on there's a lot of provisions there that you have to be aware of. Don't want to just go dumping things in storm drains willy nilly. But anyway, for a, a single family home you're not worried about water like backing up onto the roof because if the drains clog, the house is not going to collapse. You're the, what's going to happen is if, the, if this uh, gutter for and this downspout clogs, for instance, what's going to happen is the rain is just going to uh, pool up in the gutter and then eventually just start flowing over the gutter. And that the weight of the water in the gutter when in the gutter system when completely full is negligible compared to the, the weight of the roof and wind load and snow load, etc. That the roof must be able to withstand. So uh, for a, a, a decently sloped roof, you know, on a modest on a modestly sized structure, you don't really have a primary and secondary rain system, uh, rain uh, control system. Instead, you just have your uh, your roof slope takes care of most of your drainage, and then you have uh, gutters, downspouts, etc. And again. Those serve a variety of purposes, including protecting the building's foundation and also quality of life, aesthetics, and some other uh, related purposes. Now, where the uh, primary versus secondary roof uh, or primary versus secondary uh, rain collection system really comes into play is in larger structures and particularly larger structures with flat roofs. Um, or I should, if I wanted to be technical, I should say low slope roofs. Because technically, there's no such thing as a flat roof. And that's not just because, uh, you know, geometrically, there's no such thing as a flat stitch, who flat surface. But no, even on building, I'm talking even from the point of view of design. Uh, even on buildings that have, a, that we uh, sort of, that we would describe as having a flat roof. Like the roof of a warehouse, the roof of a big box store, the roof of a big, uh, the roof of a big office building, etc. Um... Even though if you were standing on the top of that roof, you might describe it as flat, in reality, it has a very, very slight, very shallow slope to it. And so how flat roofs work in terms of rain, in terms of uh, rain collection and disposal, is that even on a flat roof, they'll have very shallow slopes, and then either at the sides or somewhere in the middle, at, or basically at different locations where it's convenient for the design, uh, for the design, they will have uh, pipes coming down at the low points that then gather the rain and dispose of it um, into a uh, appropriate uh, facility. Now, uh, consider this for a moment. So, uh, let's look at 
and so uh, so we so when considering primary versus secondary we need to keep this kind of uh, structure in mind so let's say we have a building a big flat roof building and for simplicity let's say that it had um for simplicity's sake i will say that it maybe just has a single downspout right in the middle and this isn't realistic big buildings are, are going to have are usually going to have more than one drain location in them if, it, if you can get away with one drain you're probably better off just using a slightly sloped roof but well even that depends and I am uh, also I do want to mention when I draw these sloped roofs I am massively <laughs> um, exaggerating the amount of slope you can have you know tiny 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 slopes on these roofs uh, on, and, and there's a reason we refer to them as flat roofs when you're standing on the roof of a big warehouse or something it looks flat it, it even to the eye it doesn't appear sloped but when a rainstorm happens and rain starts piling on the roof that very slight slope is enough to actually allow uh, rain to flow to the rain collection rain gutter system rain drainage system etc now so that's fine that's all well and good but there is one intrinsic um there is one intrinsic benefit of this type of system with big sloped roofs uh, or with sloped roofs sloped roofs versus flat roofs and that is of course what we talked about here if these gutters clog it's not really that big a deal. If the gutters clog, the water, I mean, it's not, it's not something you want to happen. Water overflowing with the gutters can, can damage, uh, can damage siding, can damage brickwork, can damage the foundation. That's not something you want to happen, but it's not something of immediate, uh, imminent structural concern. Again, a building is not, a house is not going to collapse if its uh, gutter system clogs. However, what happens if a big flat, big box building, a big flat roof building what happened, and again, you have to imagine this is a huge warehouse or something. That is a very poorly drawn warehouse, and that is a bad drawing even for me. <laughs> anyway, what happens if this drain here clogs? So what happens if a piece of debris gets in there and clogs it? Some uh, Maybe somebody's up on the roof, or maybe a trash bag is blowing in the wind and it gets it uh, falls in the rainstorm and it gets caught up in the in the water it falls on the roof and then the, the rain gathers it and there's a trash bag lying right over top of the drain that's a problem because now water can't flow into this drain so what do you do well what's going to happen is water is going to start to pool on the roof and that's a problem without anywhere for water to go it's going to start pooling and water well, water's heavy. I mean, if you've, you've, you've know, I think everyone uh, has some intuitive sense of this. If you, uh, you know, you can, you, most people know what a gallon of water or what a liter of water feels like intuitively. Or if you want to think of it in terms of English units, if you want some numbers, it's 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Or if you're of the metric persuasion, it's, uh, of course, one thought approximately, approximately, we can talk about densities, but approximately a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. It's not as heavy as steel or concrete, but it does have a decent density to it. And more importantly, when you start uh, applying it over a very large area, the weights become significant. And moreover, um, the actual thickness, the actual depth of water we're talking about here might not be very much. We're not talking about, you know, many feet of water, but when you apply it over a massive, massive flat roof, and buildings with flat roofs do tend to be very large, um, if you have a very small building, it's worth it just to build the build, just to build the sloped roof. But the reason large buildings use flat roofs is because, think about it, if you have a building with a roof slope like this, imagine you have a building the size of a Walmart or the size of a Best Buy or the size of a big warehouse or big retail. Insert the biggest local retailer you have in your area, and imagine that building having a giant flat roof on top of it. And so for that would ha that have a couple of problems first this thing would mean to be incredibly tall on a uh, on a like big warehouse building or something so you'd need an in incredibly tall roof on some sort of warehouse which means also it's going to carry it's going to catch a ton of wind so you'll have to design that giant towering roof for the uh immense uh wind loads that are generated from such a high uh roof um plus you'll have to deal with all the gravity loading and seismic loading if that's applicable uh, where you're at and so yeah if you have so for a 
a single family home, uh, sloped roofs work great, but there is a reason for very large buildings like warehouses, we use flat roofs. Um, because again, the sloped roof works well when you have a relatively small structure, but when you start getting something really big, the sloped roof becomes untenable. Now you might think, oh, you could just, what if you just used like a series of sloped roofs on top of the warehouse? Now that would be one option, but then think about what you're gonna do on these points here. At these points here, you're going to need drain lines. Drain lines going down into the building. And at that point, you're basically reproducing the flat roof drainage system, and you have yet another system that can clog. So uh, again, keep in mind, so we're gonna be talking mainly about flat roof buildings because again, this primary secondary, uh, this primary secondary ring collection system breakdown doesn't really apply to uh, smaller structures, flat roof buildings, etc. but it does apply to very large flat roof buildings. And let's now take a look at uh, what the primary versus secondary system looks like for large flat roof buildings. So let's now again consider a flat roof building. And we're going to say that we have a, a we're going to call this a flat roof building, but we're going to say that this has a very, very, very shallow slope. And again, we're going to massively exaggerate the slope here. So this might only be a quarter of an inch slope over, over a very long distance, but, uh, or an inch slope over a very long distance, but uh, I'm going to exaggerate here for the sake of illustration purposes. So let's say I have a flat roof and in the, maybe the building is like here and a wall here. And then I have a downspout here. And this dashed line is just showing an elevation line. And so if uh, so, as, if a drop of rain falls here, water drains down, 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 it falls into the drain, and then it is disposed of uh, through various piping. Now, this piping system, the piping system that, that, you're, that uh, all of the drains flow to, this is what we refer to as the primary drainage system. So this here, this is your primary drainage system. So big flat roof buildings, again, they can't just have water flow off their surfaces because like they would on a, like you would on a, a single family home sloped roof building. But uh, so you need, you do need to have this kind of rain collection systems with uh, pipes and gutters and things inside the building. And uh, that, that any kind of uh, pipe work system, any kind of piping, any kind of uh, internal pumping or whatever you might need to get rid of the storm uh, water, that is what we refer to as the primary drainage system. Now. Again, as we mentioned, one problem is what happens if the drains become clogged? What happens if something, some piece of debris gets in there? Especially because we tend to have uh, covers and grates over these, over the tops of these inlets, um, so that water, so that uh, debris can't get into them and really clog up the deep pipes and things. But that doesn't prevent something like, again, like a piece of gar a trash or a garbage bag or something that's blown in the wind from uh, landing on here and clogging this up. So. If that happens, again, what can happen is that water will start to pool up. And so you end up with a certain amount of water pooled up on the surface. Um, and when you have a building that depends on this type of, when you have a large building that depends on this type of interior pipe work, then what, uh, then what the uh, provisions of ASC Evan require you to have, and building codes also require you to have, is a secondary drainage system. And if you and so where this is commonly implemented is that the best example I can think of for this is going to be um, is going to be the various outlets on parapet walls. So often buildings have parapet walls. Flat roof buildings often have parapet walls, and so there'd be like an opening right here, or an opening right here. And if you're not if you're not familiar with parapet walls, let's see how do I describe parapet walls. So if you have a building, like a big flat roof building, uh, often you'll have various pieces of equipment on the top of these buildings, air conditioners, um, air conditioners uh, on tall build on really tall buildings, you'll sometimes have, or at least tall relative to their surrounding area. Sometimes you'll have like cell towers on top of some of these buildings, uh, just, uh, any kind of sensors, any kind of electro, sometimes electrical equipment, just, Anything that is needed for the building's uh, mechanical functions and it's convenient to put on the roof, they will do so. So there's often a lot of equipment on the roof. And because of that, and well, 
not because of that, but uh, the, the equipment that tends to be put on uh, the roofs of buildings is not necessarily the most uh, sightly or aesthetically pleasing equipment. So oftentimes local building codes require the construction of what's known as a parapet wall. And this is not a full height wall. It's not like a, it's not like a, you know, eight foot high wall or anything. We're talking something relatively modest, you know, just like three or four feet high. I'm here in Corvallis, Oregon, and I know for a fact our local pl uh, planning code actually requires the construction of this. Um, it requires the construction of parapet walls for um, for equipment and for buildings over a certain height, flat roof buildings, etc. And the whole idea is just to make sure that this. It's not trying to make it so like you have to like you don't have to like dome over the all of the equipment entirely and completely hide it from any viewpoint. It's not like you're not trying to prevent, you know, passing aircraft from seeing an HVAC unit. What you are trying to prevent is somebody on the ground from seeing the ugly equipment up top. So what you'll have is if you look at the wall profile, you'll have your roof and then there'll be a short little wall like this. And that per then if you have some sort of piece of equipment here that will prevent, uh, if I finish drawing that person, that will prevent them from seeing the equipment because they don't have the line of sight necessary to actually view it. But anyway, the problem with those parapet walls, and so those parapet walls are fine for an, from an aesthetic point of view, but the problem with a flat roof building with parapet walls is what happens if you have your drain clogged and now you have a big perimeter wall? Without a parapet wall, uh, you know, the the amount of water that can pile up on a flat roof is, it's it exists, but it's relatively minor. You know, you're talking about an inch or two as water slowly piles up, or if you're in uh, most of the world, a couple centimeters. So um, you're talking about a relatively modest amount of rain or amount of water piling up on your building's roof. But again, what happens if you have a three or four foot high wall going all the way around the perimeter of your roof? Now you have a massive storage capacity for water, and suddenly you could you know uh, your parapet wall in a, in addition to actually uh, to serving aesthetic purposes, it now serves as a swimming pool. So what you've accidentally done, you built this for aesthetic purposes, but if this whole thing fills with water, imagine your entire roof covered in three to four feet of water. That's not good. That's no bueno. We don't want that. So instead, what parapet walls tend to have is again not for their pro not for the uh, main everyday use but for emergencies in case the uh, primary system clogs there will be secondary cutouts there will be small cutouts at the base of the parapet wall and th those will serve as emergency drains so they will be raised up a bit from the they'll be at the highest point of elevation on a slope so water won't by default flow into them but if if the main drain log if the main drain lines clog and water starts pooling up on the roof, uh, once the water gets up to the height of the base of the parapet wall, then water will start flowing out just directly onto the ground. And again, that's not necessarily the best practice. Not best practice. That's not the wrong right word. Uh, that's not the right word. That's that aesthetically, that's not the best option. And if you just left that there, it might, eventually it might cause some problems, you know, with the building foundation and such. But again, this is only for emergency purposes. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, the drainage system is going to be working perfectly fine. Water is just going to, uh, you know, flow down on the slight slope to your drain lines and be taken away uh, very easily. But if that, if your drain lines clog, you would need to have an emergency backup. And that's what these uh, small cutouts in parapet walls are for. And these cutouts, now we see what the code is referring to as the secondary drainage system. This is your secondary drainage system. So your primary drainage system is, is your actual, uh, is the kind of well-controlled, you know, properly designed, uh, you know, nice, neat, or, and, and contained, uh, properly designed by a hydraulic engineer, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. Just, um, uh, probably designed by an environmental or, or hydraulic engineer to consider the flow rates uh, from design storms and such. That's good. That's uh, you want this to be used 99.9% .9 of the time. But uh, if you have a big flat roof building, uh, again, especially the parapet wall, and water can start pooling on top of it if those drains are clogged, the provisions of the code require you to have some sort of emergency uh, drain to keep uh, water from 
for, to keep uh, clogged drains from turning the roof of your building into a swimming pool because that would be uh, no good because um, you know we build roofs for some amount of uh, we as we ta talked about a lot in previous videos when we've looked at uh, you know uh, when we've looked at how uh, provisions handle uh, LRFD versus ASD and how they handle uh, uncertainty yes we do design our structures to have a certain amount of uh, excess strength uh, built into them, excess capacity built into them. So we design to be conservative. We do design for, um, uh, we do design our buildings to take more than we're expecting them to take. But uh, there is a difference between being conservative and designing your buildings for insanity. And we do not uh, design our buildings typically to hold many, many feet of rain pooled on the roof. Because again, like I like I've mentioned previously, there is always a bigger load, and if we're starting to design for things like that, well, we might need to consider uh, extreme load cases like meteor loading. But anyway, so these are our basic definitions we need to be aware of. We have our primary drainage system, which is our uh, normal everyday drainage system that we are going to use 99.9% .9 of the time, and then our secondary emergency drainage system, which probably is going to send the water just, uh, just you know, uh, water falling off the side of the building. But this serves to prevent the roof from, to prevent the roof from collapsing in the event that our main drain lines become clogged. And again, we don't have this kind of primary, secondary uh, drainage system breakdown in smaller uh, sloped roof structures like houses. But we do see this for very large structures like flat roof buildings, such as warehouses. So consider this drawing for a moment. Again, this is going to be greatly exaggerated in scale, but uh, it will hopefully help illustrate what all of these dimensions are. So there are two primary dimensions we need to be aware of, D sub S and D sub H uh, in the provisions. Actually, let me go ahead and put a dim line on there. Anyway, so what we have here is maybe an external wall here. So we have an external wall or just a wall and then we have a drain inlet here. And then we, so I have maybe an external wall of a building here, an interior uh, drain inlet here. And then I have a parapet wall with my emergency uh, drainage, uh, emergency drain opening right here. So what the, the provisions, uh, if you look in chapter eight uh, in ASC 716, it's a relatively short chapter. It doesn't give you a whole lot of details. And the reason for that is that uh, Hydraulic design is really its own separate field. Uh, it doesn't. It's not going to tell you necessarily the full details on how to calculate um, on how to calculate design storms, that sort of thing. That's its own separate uh, field aside from just uh, ordinary structural engineering. But it does tell it. But the, the provisions do tell you a few things that you need to consider when you're designing a structure. And so the DS and the DH. The DS is the depth from the uh, primary inlet. Remember. Keep in mind the difference in definition between primary and secondary. It is the vertical distance from the primary inlet to the emergency secondary inlet. So DS really represents the depth of water that is going to pool up um, before the secondary inlet even starts to do anything. Until water, as, 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 let's say, again, you have to consider the scenario that's happening here. We're dealing with a scenario where the primary inlet is clogged. So the primary inlet um, is clogged and so before water can actually reach the secondary emergency outlet it needs to have the water needs to to start piling up and pooling up and up the, and it's going to pool up and pile up pull up and pile up lovely it's going to slowly pool up raising an elevation until it eventually reaches the elevation of the entrance to our emergency inlet um, or, or emergency outlet, whatever you want to refer to it as. <laughs> I, I always think of it just as the hole, the, for, the holes in the parapet wall. And so that is our first, uh, our first mention. DS again is the, the vertical distance from our, uh, from our uh, primary inlet to our secondary inlet. And then DH is the elevation, uh, the elevation, sort of the design elevation necessary to produce the pressure head uh, needed to um, needed to uh, to discharge the full design storm uh, flow rate. So, what I mean by this is uh, think back to hydraulics, think back to fluid mechanics. Uh, you know that uh, for a fluid, as you go deeper in the fluid, pressure increases. So, pressure you could use oh something like rho gh. 
And if you have an, if you have a, uh, let's say you have a wall with an opening in it, the flow rate out of that uh, fluid, say, say you have a bucket with a hole in it. Like if you literally just have a bucket, it's filled with water and you cut a hole at various heights. And you cut, so let's say you cut a hole here or you cut a hole here. There is going to be more flow, there's going to be a higher flow rate out of the bottom one, out of a hole drilled lower, then so you can have maybe if the arrow represents the flow rate, um, and we could do the math on figuring that out, but it's pretty intuitive to realize that the lower you drill that hole, the greater the flow rate is going to, uh, the water is going to come out of that hole. And that's simply because of pressure. Pressure differential is what's driving that jet of water uh, leaving the, or the stream of water uh, leaving that container. And the uh, the greater the pressure head, the, again, the, ele the, the elevation above the hole of, of fluid compressing down and driving that fluid out, the greater the pressure head, the uh, faster water is going to leave that hole. So uh, for a certain storm, so when you design a water system, there is a design storm you can need to consider. And that's based on, um, that's based on certain environmental conditions, site conditions, et cetera, including things like, uh, and it, it's this whole other topic. Uh, we're not, I'm not wanting, I don't wanna get too far into hydraulic engineering here, but um, the key thing to keep in mind is one of the things that, are, that is designed is a, a peak uh, storm flow rate. Uh, well, actually, it's going to be more of a storm rate over a uh, flow rate over an area. So you might have something that's like uh, X inches per hour per square foot, which is a lovely uh, set of units um, or other measures. Basically, this would be saying at, say, uh, at your peak storm rate, let's say you, your peak rate was, I don't know, it's hard to pick a number, but let's say you had two inches per hour per square foot. That means at the max, if you had something like this, and this is what your environmental analysis, uh, your hydraulic analysis concluded, what, what that is saying is that every square foot of the rain, of, of the roof will experience on average uh, two square inches per hour. So if that, if, if in turn uh, uh, you are, let's say in turn, you are uh, draining an area of like, let's say your inlet drains an area of a thousand square feet, well, if you multiply those two together, you will get, and do some unit conversions, you'll get a cubic foot per hour. If you multiply an area, uh, an aerial, basically a, a flow rate per area, by an area, you will get a flow rate. And again, and the reason that's important is that every, when, when designing a, a storm drainage system or designing a drainage system on a building, it needs to be able to handle whatever flow rate is applied to the area that's, that it's designed to handle. Now, because this system, think about what is driving water out of this. As water pools up, you know, the instant water, uh, the instant the water pools up and reaches the inlet here, how much water is flowing out of there? Think about that for a second. As the water slowly rises, eventually it reaches the uh, emergency outlet here. Uh, how, what is the flow rate right as it starts? Well, initially, if you think about, like, if I, if I create a, uh, a plot of something like, um, maybe like depth, oh, maybe do something like this, depth versus flow rate. Well, I don't know, I'd have to think about whether this would be linear or parabolic or something, but it's definitely going to have a positive slope. At zero, at zero depth, the flow rate is going to be zero. There is no pressure, there is no pressure head driving that outflow when the surface of the water is right here. So the, in order for any appreciable flow rate to actually start exiting through the holes in the parapet, additional water has to pool up and then you have enough pressure to actually drive fluid flow through this opening. And so eventually as water pools higher and higher, now again, initially there's zero. And then once it's up here, there's a very slight amount of flow and then it just keeps go, it keeps piling up higher and higher or pooling up higher and higher until eventually the depth of water above the opening is sufficient to uh, achieve whatever your design flow rate is. Any water system is uh, one of the initial design variables in this water system would be your flow rate. 
And that's actually what you would use to size your pipes, um, your collection lines, any pumps if need be, anything like that. All of that would be sized based on uh, predicted flow rates. And so um, what needs, so again, uh, if you have that flow rate and you have a certain number of openings, uh, you can apply some basic fluid mechanics uh, equations and principles and see that, okay, for that given flow rate, uh, a certain amount of water is going to have to pile up before we actually get at that discharge rate at the, before we actually start discharging the full uh, design flow rate uh, through our secondary flow system. And that height, the height necessary to, call, to reach our design flow rate, that is dH. So again, ds, ds is just the physical dimension, is just a simple dimensional, a simple geometric quantity. It is just the vertical distance from the, from the, from the entrance to the primary, uh, from the primary drainage system to the secondary drainage system. And dh is basically how much pressure head you need before the secondary emergency, the secondary emergency drainage system is discharging enough water to meet your peak uh, flow rate demand. So you have ds, you have dh, and these are our two variables uh, that we're going to use in our design equation. So we've now seen the definitions for both our primary and secondary drainage systems, and we've learned the definitions for both d sub s and d sub h. Finally, there is one equation we need to consider, that's ASCE uh, 716 8.3-1. And this is the, I would say, a rather important one. And this is simply R is equal to 5.2 times ds plus dh. So what does all this mean? Well, ds and dh, these are just our properties as we've defined them. Again, ds is the uh, depth to the secondary inlet, and dh is the pressure head necessary to uh, for the secondary drainage system to uh, fully dispose of the full peak uh, storm design runoff. So we've talked about those already. R Oh, also, uh, keep in mind, these are in inches. And there is a different equation in ASC7 for metric units. Uh, the same thing with almost all the equations in ASC7, or you can just uh, calculate them through some simple conversions. But it is the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers uh, provisions. So, uh, well, this is Freedom Land, so we use English units for some reason. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. So DS and DH are in inches. R is uh, is going to be a uh, a pressure load or a uniform pressure load and it's in units of PSF. What is R? Well, you can read the provisions in ASC7, but in short, R is the uh, uniform pressure or the uniform rain pressure that a roof must be that a uh, a roof must be designed for. This is the R that intend that in turn will uh, be used in the load combina in the various ASC seven uh, LRFD or ASD load combinations. So once you have this uniform pressure, then you can apply tributary areas. You can find loads on beams. You can find uh, loads on columns, and all the lovely things that we've already talked about so far in this course. Now, a few cav not caveats, a few uh, details on this. First, uh, this is on the undeformed shape. So this is based on the undeformed shape, which will be important in our next conversation, or the next topic of conversation, ponding. But uh, these are calculated based on the undeformed shape. So uh, you'll look at the initial design of your roof and calculate all of the uh, you get your DH or your DS based on the roof geometry, DH based on the hydraulic calculations, and then based on that, you'll get a uh, R pressure and you'll apply that uniformly over the entire roof. Also note, however, this is conservative. This is, um, note that in reality, if you have that kind of slope, this is treating this, uh, this equation here is applying a uniform load to the entire roof and uh, so if you have your outlet here and then the drain, the your primary drain here, the secondary drain here, uh, this is assuming this entire volume ends up filled. And at first that may seem overly conservative, but again, we're talking about very, very, very shallow 
uh, very shallow uh, slopes, so it's actually not too bad uh, when you actually look at it, look at some numbers. And so um, apply it over, the, so you basically calculate this pressure and then you apply it over the entire roof. Now, where does this mysterious 5.2 factor come in? Is this based on, is this number, does this number come out of years of statistical analysis of, uh, you know, is this from a paper that distills down a hundred various rain study papers? Uh, no, this one, uh, now there are plenty of things like that in the ASC 7 provisions, especially when you get, deal with things like uh, rain load and, uh, or it's not rain load, uh, seismic and wind load and some other more uh, tricky types of loading. But this, as far as loading goes, uh, rain load is probably one of the simpler types of loading you have to deal with. Uh, rain is not fun to deal with if it ever leaks into your house. Um, if you've ever had that problem after a hurricane, I know I have. It's not fun. But uh, so in terms of individual experience, rain load isn't great. But in terms of design, rain load is relatively simple compared to some other types of loading. You just have to calculate the amount of rain that your roof might end up having to hold. And then you apply that as a load. Water is not going to suddenly start weighing more than it otherwise, more than it normally does. If it does, we have bigger problems than uh, some slight rain load. Um, and I mean, in terms of pounds per cubic foot, that kind of thing, kilonewtons per cubic meter, whatever you want to say. But uh, so if, if the density of water starts changing on us, we have bigger problems than uh, rain load. The laws of physics are a muck for some reason that day. <laughs> anyway, um, and also unlike things like seismic load and uh, wind load, uh, you don't have, you know, incredibly variable uh, uh, input parameters and that kind of thing, but I'm getting, I'm going off on a tangent. So backing up, where does this number come from? Well, if an interesting thing happens, remember how, do you remember what we said the specific uh, weight of water is, or the density if you prefer? That is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And if you really want to be pedantic, you could say it was pound force, not pound mass per cubic foot, but it's 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. See this, the dimension here is in inches. The dimension here is in pounds per square foot. So um, if, you do, if you divide this by 12, suddenly you will get 5.2. All this is, all this 5.2 factor is, is a factor to convert for the inches to PSF. That's all it is. And you can work through the units yourselves uh, if you'd like, if you like some demonstration of that. But yeah, that's all it is. It is simply a, uh, it, it is not a complicated empirical equation factor. Uh, rain load, again, is relatively straightforward. You're simply calculating the, uh, you calculate your D, uh, DS, which is the depth from the, uh, your, you measure, determine your DS. The, def the uh, elevation change from your primary to your secondary inlet, you measure your D or you calculate your DH, which is the amount of head necessary, uh, amount of uh, fluid head necessary before your uh, secondary outlets are uh, discharging the full uh, uh, storm uh, peak load, peak storm rain load, whatever you want to call it. And then uh, you simply add them together, multiply by two, and that is your uniform pressure that you need to apply to the roof of your building. And again, the DS and DH are all calculated based on the undeformed roof shape. And this is one reason we, um, this is actually one reason that you do do the kind of, uh, and backing up undeformed versus deformed, we're gonna talk about ponding now, but in, in, a, in a one second, we're gonna talk about ponding, but this kind of, uh, this, if, if this does seem conservative, realize we are basing this on the undeformed shape rather than the, rather than the deformed shape. So finally, let's talk about ponding. Again, we have our, our the drawing that we've been looking at. We have DS, which is again the this, the vertical distance from the primary inlet to the secondary inlet, and we have DH, the pressure head necessary to uh, fully uh, discharge all of the peak flow rate uh, from this from our design storm. Now, uh, mention remember how I mentioned that all of that the uh, DS and DH these are calculated based on the undeformed, undeflected uh, roof shape. And this is, and uh, all, we also mentioned two, th well, let me just write these down, two things. One, these DS and DH are based on undeflected roof shape. And two, uh, it is somewhat conservative.
as we assume the maximum depth throughout. The max depth throughout, and let me illustrate what I mean by that. So we're assuming the maximum depth throughout the roof. We're applying a uniform pressure across the entire roof. Now, think about the depth of water that we're talking about. ds plus dh, um, if we think about where that peak depth actually exists, it would only exist right above the inlet, um, right at the uh, right above the primary inlet. At the secondary inlet, the depth of the water is only dh, just by even by basic definition. And so it is, but instead what we're doing is we're applying this entire dh plus ds over the entire roof, even though in actuality, only the peak, uh, only the, um, only directly above the primary inlet would actually experience that full depth. So this is somewhat conservative. But um, before you think that's too conservative, realize that this does take in, that this conservative calculation is really meant to cover your ass on one particular thing. Or, uh, sorry, not CYA. Uh, it's meant to uh, provide uh, adequate factors of safety and adequate uh, levels of reliability and public safety. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's say we have a, okay, so in order to, to consider why this is important, and why can't we just why can't I, why can't I just apply a triangular load to this and then or a trapezoidal load or something? Yeah, I guess it would be trapezoidal. Why can't you might ask why can't I just apply a trapezoidal load to my roof instead of this uniform thing? Because in theory, I should be just based on the amount based on the geometry of the situation. You would think you could just apply a trapezoidal load, and the maximum value of that trapezoid would be the va would tra that the maximum value of that trapezoidal load would be the load that I'm applying to the entire roof that I, that I have to apply to the entire roof. And you, in based on pure geometry, you would be right. However, this conservative blanket uniform application of the maximum load is meant to partially cover your butt uh, in, in the case of ponding. And ponding really is the Achilles heel of flat roof design. If anything is going to cause the collapse of a roof from rain load, it's probably ponding. Although there, there are, of course, exceptions to everything, but this is one of the biggest causes of collapse, of actual, not just, you know, failure or, you know, inconvenient, unaesthetic, annoying rainfalls off the side of roofs, but actual collapse of roofs. Ponding is one of the things that, that can actually cause that. And what happens is that, okay, you need to think about your roof here. So let's, let's model a, a building's roof. And actually, maybe I'll model it, oh, not like this. I do want to show a slight slope on this. So let me draw a flat roof with a very slight slope. Because again, realize these flat roofs are, of course, I've, I am massively exaggerating the slope in my diagrams here. So, but still, let's draw a flat roof like this. So this is the shape of the roof at before a, a single drop of water falls on it. And then, it, so let's say, and oh, and let's say it's uh, the worst case scenario and the drain line is clogged. So no water is flowing into here. And so all the water has to flow out the secondary drain. Well, uh, as we've seen, water will pool up, uh, up to the point where it's basically at the, uh, at the sufficient elevation, at sufficient elevation to have enough head to fully discharge all of the uh, design storm load storm uh, rain runoff load etc again though this was the undeformed shape this was the initial undeformed shape and think about what actual buildings would really you know we've talked a lot about idealized rigid bodies in this class so far but think about what uh roofs or what real structures actually do what do they do under load they deform so when i apply a rain load a depth of rain load to a building or to the roof of a building it's going to deform slightly. And that's fine, a, a slight deformation, all floors and roofs and things like that, uh, any structure will deform under gravity load, live load, etc. But with rain, but, but with rain load, it's particularly insidious. See, if, a, if you have a building with live load on it, for example, if it deflects, the amount of live load on the, on the uh, building doesn't change. 
Like if you, uh, you know, uh, if you if you have an empty room and you move furniture into it, and move especially big heavy furniture, the floor will deform slightly, but the weight of the furniture isn't going to magically increase. But look what you've done when you're. Uh, but look what you've done when your uh, when your flat roof deforms. You have now created more volume for water to pool in. And uh, hopefully alarm bells should be going off in your head because this is the kind of thing that can quickly get out of hand. So your, uh, what can happen is that as you deform, you know, under the, you reach your maximum rain load. And then because of that, your uh, roof deforms, which means it can now hold more water. Uh, and uh, assuming the storm isn't over and more rain is falling, that space gets filled up with more water. And, that, and guess what that causes? Oh, right. That causes more deflection, which means, of course, you can now hold even more water, which means it's going to deflect more, which means it's going to hold more water, which means it's going to deflect more until your roof is on the ground and hopefully no one was underneath it. Now, this is absolutely a worst case scenario and it's not something that's typically encountered. Um, what the Parisian, so the, uh, this uniform load assumption that we talked about does not completely absolve you of ponding. Uh, what the, what the provisions of the code say is that you have to consider ponding, especially for flexible roofs. And it just kind of leaves that to the designer to figure out. There's no hard and fast rules. It really depends on the type of building system you're using. Most of the time for modest structures, this isn't going to be a problem for, you know, most flat roof structures of modest size. The uh, this kind of uniform load assumption will take care of this because you're because you are designing your roof to carry uh, more than will actually be applied. Again, you're assuming the maximum depth of water is applied over the entire area of the roof, and that take that takes care of this kind of excess load. You can just you can um, uh, you can take care of this by with that kind of assumption. Also, realize that I am greatly exaggerating here. Uh, this won't just increase exponentially. Instead, what will tend to happen is it will it will tend to reach some sort of asymptotic uh, limit, where you know the the first load causes the max amount of deflection, and uh, and that because the max amount of deflection, the second bit of additional rain causes a slightly less deflection. The next bit of rain causes even less. Each bit of rain does cause a tiny bit of deflection, but it, uh, it usually asymptotically approaches a limit. But for, but the uh, provisions of ASC 7 do say that if you have a particularly flexible roof, if you have a very flexible roof diaphragm, then you can get sufficient ponding that the entire roof might collapse. So um, for most structures, the provisions will be fine here. The, uh, the assumption of uniform load will be fine. But if you're designing a building with a very flexible roof, a flat roof building with a very flexible roof, you need to consider ponding, otherwise your roof may end up on the ground. And hopefully there's no one underneath it at the time. Anyway, that's what I wanted to cover in terms of rain load. I, uh, there aren't too many calculations to go over on this. And while we could look at an entire uh, series of calculations, a full example or whatnot, the real trouble with that is that uh, uh, we need variables that really arrive from, uh, that really come out of hydraulic design. Uh, for structural engineers, what we're really concerned with, and this is a structural analysis class, not a hydraulics class, and so we're concerned with just the behavior of structures. And so from a structural analysis point of view, we need to be aware of the basic provisions of ASC 7, and also need to be aware of, of the mechanisms involved, and I think we've covered those in this video. So again, key things to be aware of, be aware of what the definitions are, DS, DH, um, be aware of the kind of assumptions that are baked into this, be aware of the primary versus secondary drainage system, and be aware of the unique danger that ponding can occur or can uh, create in particular to buildings with very flexible roofs. So, uh, and of course you can read more into this in great depth, like anything we cover in these videos, the uh, depth of knowledge is, that you can dig into is never ending. Anyway, so I hope that'll, uh, I think that'll do it for now. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Feel free to leave any uh, comments or thoughts in the comments below. If not, I hope you found this uh, enjoyable or uh, enjoyable or at least a little informative. Like, comment, and subscribe to make the YouTube robots happy. Lovely. We're living in a post, uh, or, or boring dystopia, I guess we could say. I, I don't know. With a, a cyberpunk dystopia, maybe that's the right word for it. Uh, we're getting out of, getting uh, off on another tangent here. <laughs>
anyway, hope you found this enjoyable or useful. Feel free to leave a comment if you would like, like, comment, subscribe, etc. Uh, regardless, I hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.